Chapter One, The Reporter. Hi, Dana. How you doing? Good. Hey. You got a moment? Yeah, I'm just like, can you give me five? Will you be back there? Cool. I'll just, uh, I'll just meet you in that room with your stuff. Hello, hello. Do I need to bring it closer? Hello. Yeah, here we go. <clears throat> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So, Rukmini, mm-hmm. before I started following you around all the time, <laughs> yes. um, I knew that you were a reporter. Mm-hmm. I knew that you talked to terrorists on the internet. Right. I knew that ISIS was your beat. But I don't think I had any idea what that reporting actually, actually looks like. like. Right, right. Yeah. Hey, Hawk. When you hear that, it's outgoing. Outgoing. Like I didn't know you are going right up to the front lines of the war against ISIS. There's a building that appears to have been airstriked. And as the coalition soldiers are pushing ISIS back, have these buildings been cleared? You are right there, directly behind them. What are you doing right now? I'm trying to get out some trash bags. We're about to go into the building. And you pull out garbage bags. Hang on, stick it here like trash bags that you've brought from home. And you just start picking stuff up. Bunch of computers, hard drives yanked out. Like garbage out of buildings. This is the school So we basically have an ISIS tamper here. Um, So we're in the right place. And when I tell people about that part of your job, Mm -hmm. they almost always ask two questions. First, there's a backpack right there and I really want to search it, but I'm a little scared to put my hand inside it. Isn't that dangerous? It could be booby trapped, huh? Could be. And I'm always like, yes, (laughs) very dangerous. There are explosions. That's close. And gunfire. Hey, smoke. You see this? And airstrikes. How many airstrikes have you heard before? Three or four? Three or four? Try like ten. And the other question they ask is, how is that worth it? Right. Like, what, what do you say to that? So look, every reporter that covers conflict and war knows that you have to be there. You have to be on the ground if you want to try to understand the story. And as for me, I'm trying to understand ISIS. And one thing I've learned is that if you're able to get to the buildings that they occupied right after they are liberated, and I mean right after. Rukmini, can you describe what you're doing? Well, we're in um, in a room off the side of a church that ISIS had used as a base. I'm looking at a notebook here. You often can find the documents that they left behind. Look at this one. It's a little diary. It's like day by day. D- these are not documents that are meant for publication. So look, this is where they slept. This is a prayer mat. And then over there, these are the rockets that they, oh that they manufactured. Yeah. Imagine if you walked into my home right now, right? If you walked in right now, you would probably find my Bank of America statement. If you found that, you would find all of my daily transactions. You would know what diet I have. You would know that I have a penchant for buying a certain kind of rice milk. Uh, You would know the stores that I go to shop at. So you might conclude from that that I'm probably middle class. If you walked over to the bookshelf, you would find books in Romanian, in English, and in French. And you could deduce from that that I most likely speak three languages or that members of my family are bilingual or trilingual. If you went upstairs and you went into my bedroom and you found my diary, you would find my most private thoughts. And you're saying yep. you do that. And so to I ISIS. do that. So I am doing that to ISIS and Al Qaeda. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> right? I am looking for ISIS's diary. I am looking for their internal correspondence, their receipts, their personal tiffs with coworkers, some of which end up getting sent to the equivalent of ISIS HR. Mm-hmm. Um, the things they're struggling with, that they're writing letters back and forth about. And so the documents are generally what you are using to answer this question, who are we really fighting? Yeah. You you drove to Syria with with your friend from Bremen, right? I thought to myself, go down there, I live under Sharia. Of course, I'm a journalist, so I also want to talk to them. They said we need people who are willing to give their life, especially in suicide mission. 
That's incredibly difficult, but I've been able to speak to around two dozen of them, both in prisons in Europe. What did he do before ISIS came here? And in jails in both Syria and Iraq. He worked four months with them as a mechanic. Those interviews have been crucial for me in understanding the general framework of how ISIS works and the motivations that push people to join them. But many of those interviews have also left me frustrated. They tired him and put him, bent him over his chair. Because. And he chopped off his head. The overwhelming pattern is that they'll have witnessed an execution, they'll have witnessed a beheading, they'll have been present when a stoning took place. When you saw those things, did you feel sick to your stomach? What was your reaction? I was shaky because I was shocked. But they never took part in it themselves. It seems to me that many times along the way you said no. They weren't getting suspicious of you at this point? they They were all looking at me and were asking me, why are you here then? Over and over This is the story they tell. When they did so, he said, I don't want to work with you anymore. So he he quits. They were a cook. They were a driver. They were a translator. So, Bashir, do you want to tell me what really happened? Or do you not want to be interviewed at all? They present themselves as having been witnesses to horror, but never having carried out the horror themselves. I've I've lost interest because he's contradicted himself so many times that I just can't tell that anything he's saying is true. That's usually how it goes. Usually. Did you guys consider, you know, in these suicide attacks, like the Paris attacks, yeah. obviously children and women were also killed. Yeah. How, how did they justify that? They said that um, they use the exact same justification for every attack. It's that they do it to us, so we do it to them. They bomb our women and children indiscriminately. We do it to them. So at a certain point, you decide that you want to quit. Yeah. Can you, can you, was there one moment or a series of moments? The second time I did the kill, I killed someone. What are you? What are we gonna? What are we gonna call him? The Canadian? He wants us to call him Abu Huzaifa. This is his his code name that he's chosen. Right. This is his nom de guerre, as they call it. And every ISIS fighter has a nom de guerre. They don't enter the terrorist group with their own name. And the reason they do that is as a security measure to try to protect their identity. So Huzaifa. Huzaifa. Abu Huzaifa. Abu Huzaifa. Yeah. All right. And how did you find him? It started with Instagram. So he came to my attention through a researcher named Anat Agren. She, um, like me, trolls these chat rooms and these platforms. And she had gone online and found Abu Huzaifa's Instagram feed. And in that Instagram feed, she was able to put together that Abu Huzaifa is a Canadian, that he had been inside the Islamic State sometime, uh, we believed, in 2014, and that he had returned to Canada and was somehow living in the general population. Did you ever see his Instagram? Yes. I, yeah. Um, let's take a look. You've got it. You've got it on his... Uh, these are screenshots that you took on your... These are screenshots that, that Anat took. Uh, he's taken it down since then. Okay. So basically his, um, his profile just shows the smiling kid... Um, Looks like he's wearing, what, like maybe a workout shirt. Yeah. Um, but if you go back through it, there are some things that are that are somewhat disturbing. So, for example, he reposts an image of a knife. Hang on, let me find it. Here it is. To me, it looks like a combination between a screwdriver and a normal knife. So it has this circular, this kind of spiral shape so that wherever you insert it, Um, it it doesn't cut along just one edge. It cuts in a spiral direction. And and there's a caption on the image that he reposted. The caption says, deadliest knife ever. It takes a team of surgeons to seal the wound. Victim bleeds out in minutes. This is one evil knife. Hmm. So Anat ended up doing a report on this and she sent it to me. And I passed this on to to our research team at uh, the New York Times. And they were then able to cross-reference that material with his LinkedIn account. 
on his LinkedIn account, we found his email and I sent him an email expecting like I always do that, that these people are not going to respond to me. Wait, what, what did you say in your email? I, I said to him what I always say, which is my name is Rukmini Kalimaki. I'm a reporter for The New York Times where I cover um, Al-Qaeda and ISIS. And I'm very interested to learn um, about the Islamic State and your experience uh, inside it. And of course, I sent this expecting, you know, the obvious, which is that either he would not respond or he would say no. But hello, hello it's Rukmini here from The New York Times. How are you? Good, hi, Rukmini. How are you? Good, good, good. Are, am I catching you while you're in the car? Uh, yeah, but it's okay. I got hands free. Okay. To my true surprise, a couple of days later, he responded. And I'd left Canada not directly for, uh, for Syria. Yep. In the email, you know, I very gently asked him for his phone number. Once I had his phone number, I asked him if he would let me call him. Then I called him, and then I asked him for permission to come to uh, to Canada to see him. And um, yeah. would you allow me to come to with my team? At, at every step, I thought he was going to say no. Um, when would you come? I mean, that's that's kind of up to you. I mean, I the think fact that he I said yes, to... and the fact that it had been so easy to find him started to make me feel nervous. You know, I, I remember thinking, is there something I'm missing? Is this is this maybe a fake? I did post on Instagram, but see, when I posted that, I posted it under the guise that it was private. I didn't yeah. think anyone was watching. I didn't think even you would come across that. Right. Why does he want to talk to me? You know, why Why would he want to talk to me? So can you show me certain things? Like, can you show me your... Um the stamps in your passport. Do you have images from Syria? But what kept me going is 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 I could also hear the hesitancy in his voice. I have a few things I can show you. And so I had to take the chance. So test test. That's good. So the next step is is you and I, you know, booked a ticket. You think it would throw off the feng shui if you sat here? Mm -mm. And we flew to Canada. We're not going to say where we went. The microphone faces this way, and mm -hmm. you're projecting your voice this mm -hmm. way. You know, we set up ourselves in, in this hotel room. I texted him the, the name of the hotel, the address, uh, the room number, and he agreed to come after the end of his work day because he was working, I believe, at a restaurant. And then we started to wait. And he was initially late by 15 minutes, then 20 minutes, then 30 minutes. We're... Um... We are still waiting. He says rush hour. I'm texting him and and wondering if we're going to be, you know, stood up. About an hour now has gone by. I mean, at, at a certain point, I almost gave up. I thought, this is it. You know, we've basically just thrown away a plane ticket to Canada. And at some point, I remember that you turned around to ask me, do you think there's any chance that this person is dangerous? Right, I asked you if you ever got scared. Do you remember what you did? No. Have you ever been afraid? Afraid, of course. Well, first... Oh, fuck. <laughs> um, a vacuum cleaner suddenly flipped on in one of the hotel rooms around us, uh, which scared me. I had this really embarrassing thing happen. Um, and then... You're recording. <laughs> can that not be? No, this is too embarrassing, yeah. Okay. You had me turn off the microphone. I had you off, turn off the recorder, right? <laughs> right. And then you told me a story, and I think that, would would you tell that story now? About the 911 call? Yeah. Yeah. Um, sure. So, I don't usually scare easily, but in 2015, I get a phone call from the FBI. Are you uh, Ms. Rukmini Kalimaki? Yes, I am. Uh, may I come to see you right now? I can be at your office in the next 20 minutes. And we went into a conference room, not far from here, and um, the agent read a prepared statement. He said, you are the subject of a targeted threat from the Islamic State, and we can't tell you more. That was the first serious threat. But it started to percolate, you know, somewhere, that they were noticing what I was doing. Since then, I've seen how I've become a presence in their online chat rooms. They talk about my reporting, they dissect my tweets, they sometimes insult me. And these insults, if I can if I can just say so, sometimes are pretty funny. I think they figured out that I'm sensitive about my weight. So they sometimes call me Oink Meanie instead of Rukmini. 
it's oink meaning like pig, fat mochi. <laughs> oink meaning fat mochi. I'm sorry to laugh. <laughs> so, I'm laughing because I'm, I, I mean, there's something ironic about being fat shamed by ISIS, you know? <laughs> so, um, you know, they'll, they'll make jabs about how I've put on a couple of pounds based on my latest, you know, TV appearance. But then sometimes what they say is dead serious. So, for example, when I was in Mosul a couple of months ago, they started talking about how they were hoping that I would get killed in Mosul, just like the Kurdish journalist who was killed there at the same time uh, in the city. Hmm. Uh, but then let's see, what are the others? Um, Do you have like a folder on your phone where you keep the threats? Is that what I'm looking at here? Yeah, exactly. One of them is a masked man who was holding up a knife that he's pointing towards the camera. And he said, um, under a picture of me, wanted to be kill this crusader woman that refuses to join to Islam, Rukmini Kalimaki. Please join to religion before beheading or truck from our soldiers of Islamic State. OK, pretty explicit. Um, uh, so, they, so they created a channel where they're pretending to be me. And then they're pretending to post in this channel as me. And it says, I, I have to confess something here. I started covering ISIS because they are real men. I always fantasize about getting raped by them. That's all my fantasies. This is the sole reason I made multiple trips to Mosul just to get captured by ISIS so that they can uh, fulfill my desires. So I'm used to this stuff now. But back when the FBI first came, it didn't really sink in. It was so unbelievable that honestly, I just... I think I just stored it away somewhere else. And then weeks went by. There was another apparent terror attack in Europe, this time in Germany. And months went by. A series of deadly bombs, at least one packed with nails, killing dozens, injuring hundreds. And in that period of time, I covered attack after attack. Two terrorists stormed the church during morning mass, taking a priest, two nuns, and two churchgoers hostage. And a planned and deliberate attack in suburban Sydney. It, it starts to just marinate in your consciousness. Yeah. German media reports the attacker shouted Allahu Akbar as he hacked at the passengers. And then about a year later, I was home alone late at night. I'm Michelle Goldberg. I'm Ross Douthat. And I'm David Leonhardt. We're the hosts of The Argument, a new podcast from the New York Times opinion section. These days, it's more important than ever to listen to people who disagree with you. Maybe they'll teach you something new. Or maybe they'll just teach you how to beat them. So listen to The Argument from the New York Times. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you like to listen. So I'm home alone. And I'm by myself because at this point in time, my husband was working the overnight at his company. At 12.30, I think, at night, I'm getting ready to go to bed. I'm, I'm actually under the covers uh, and I'm upstairs with my two dogs. And suddenly, my Rhodesian Ridgeback, which is a big dog, starts growling. The hair on his back is straight up. Immediately afterwards, I start hearing somebody ringing the doorbell downstairs. And they're ringing continuously. So it's not like, it's not like knock, knock, and then go away. It's like, bzz, bzz, you know, knock, knock, knock. I'm thinking to myself, what is this? You know, like, like you know, who, who is this? What is this? So I get a hold of my, my husband, who assures me that it's not him. At this point, I've turned off the lights in the second floor bedroom because I don't want the people who are outside to see where I am. So the dog is barking, the knocking is going on, and the doorbell is ringing and ringing and ringing. At this point, I'm so scared that, like, my hands are not even working. 911, where is your emergency? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm sorry to bother you. I don't know if this is an emergency. So the FBI agent who had come to see me had told me that they had alerted the particular police precinct uh, where I lived. He said, if you ever have, you know, any issues, all you have to do is call 911. They have you on a list. We'd rather that you call um, rather than waiting for, you know, for something to happen. My name is Rukmini Kalimaki, and I've had direct threats against me and my family. Uh, Ma'am, where is your emergency? But yes. the operator who picked up must have thought I was crazy. Okay, so you're being... The FBI is making threats against you, is what you're saying? No, I saw it. Did you see anyone? I was afraid to go up. I was afraid to show myself. Like, I just saw the silhouette of a person. And I can't remember exactly what the woman said, but it was something like, ma'am, are you trying to tell me that ISIS is ringing your doorbell? Okay, I'll send an officer over to talk to you. 
Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank You're you. welcome. Bye-bye. So she calls me back and she says, ma'am, um, I am calling to tell you that we've investigated and it happens to be um, the, the water department. There's been a water main break on your street. And as a result of this, they're going house to house to tell the neighborhood that your toilet is not going to flush. What do you think the, the moral of that story is? Now? <sighs> What's the moral of that story? Like, why is it that that's the story you chose to tell me when I asked you if you've ever been afraid? I guess... The story illustrates how <laughs> I got ensnared into the very thing that ISIS is trying to do. Because in the end, the, the purpose of these acts of savagery and violence are to terrorize us. Mm. They're trying to scare us, right? They're trying to make themselves into boogeymen and live in our imagination. And that night... Yeah, they got you. They got me that night. Yeah. So back to the hotel, uh, we were we were there for like what two hours? Yeah, and then suddenly, out of the blue, there was a knock at the door of our hotel room, and I was shocked because I had expected him to go to the lobby and that the lobby would call us, but instead he had managed to walk past the lobby. <laughs> Thank you for coming. We were getting a tad nervous. We were like, "Oh my god!" How-? The traffic is really bad. It's like peak hour too. Yeah. And I opened the door. And he had a hoodie on, and the hoodie was pulled so far forward that I could barely see his face. His face was in shadow. And he kept it kind of pulled down like that for some time. Come on in. So we, um, we thought that we would... What, what did you want him to sit here? Um, I remember both of us being really friendly. <laughs> yes, exactly. I was like overtly like, hey, you want to sit down? You know, like, right. Can I get you some tea? Uh, no, it's not no? fun. Yeah. Uh, and this water is we have water. Well. <laughs> And, and then and then we sat down and started talking. Right. So first of all, thank you so much for coming. I know that you're you're obviously taking a risk, you know, in speaking to us. Um, so I just wanted to ask if it's okay that we call you Abu Huzaifa. Abu Huzaifa. Abu Huzaifa. Abu Abu Huzaifa. Yeah, with an F. Okay. Got with it. an F. So as you know, I'm Rukmini. Um, this is Andy. Hi. Mm-hmm. Um, and as I explained to you when we talked earlier. Um, I'm trying to understand the ideology of ISIS. Uh, it's obviously an ideology that has a lot of pull. Tens of thousands of people have joined this group. Mm-hmm. And I'm looking to you in the hopes that you can help us understand it better. Oh. Does that sound okay? Mm, yeah. 